because that's something that you can uh, uh, relate to very easily. But we're now going to talk about, that about the robotic assembly. Of course, this will be important if you determine in your group that actually what you're going to try and do is to make your product as a full robotic assembly device. So let's look at some of the issues related to that. So what we're going to try and do is to review the issues relating to design for robotic assembly that we've already considered manually. But do we need a different approach to robotic or automated assembly? Or actually, are the issues the same? Let's, we need to think about that. Okay, so this is our approach for uh, uh, design for assembly. If you haven't already realized there's a little schematic, it shows basically what we are doing. First of all, we're selecting in stage one an assembly method. And hopefully immediately after this morning, your groups will be starting to think about that. But then we've got a dilemma. What if the selection of the method tells us it has to be robotic assembly? Or what if it tells us it has to be manual assembly or something in between? <coughs> Do we need a different approach? Either way, we have to converge on improving the design and reanalyzing it. So whichever way we go, we have to improve the design, we have to show that we've got an increased design efficiency, whichever way we go. Now we're familiar with uh, automated assembly environments, particularly if we look at the automotive industry, where uh, most automobiles now are assembled using robotic assembly, minimum of manual assembly, and of course the cars are now designed to allow that to happen, or to allow that to be facilitated, or to allow the components to be picked up with robotic arms. And here we've got components that might be windows, and if you were a, if you were a human being, you obviously are a human being, <laughs> human beings picking that up would do it in a particular way, yeah? depending on your strength, whether you're right or left handed, pick it up different ways. But of course the robot, the robot has to be told how to do it. And the part has to be designed to allow the robot to do it. So we've got to think if we're going to use robots in this way, we've got to think about how these parts should be designed to allow them to pick it up. What a, a human might find difficult, a robotic arm might find very easy. And what a human finds easy, a robot might find quite difficult. So we might have to change the detail of the design depending on how we're actually putting it together. So you have to make this decision. You have to make it very clear on how you're designing it. And what we'll find is that, okay, we've all got hands to help us to do this, and they're pretty much the same. Dimensionally, they'll vary a little bit. They're pretty much operating in the same way. Robots can be very different. suction to help the whole thing. They could use magnets to help the whole things. They could use a clamping force. Yeah, they could use a range of things. One good thing about our hands and arms is that they're compliant. If we find that there's resistance when they're assembling a component, then we adjust our hand accordingly to eliminate that resistance and to we can feel the part into the, the location. The robot to do that requires it is designed to be compliant. And that makes the design much more difficult. So we have to think about it. We have to think about designing the robot hand to suit the component. And once you get into that situation, your costs start to rise. And you have to realize that. That there isn't one universal robot ripper that will do everything. We have to think about the different situations and what's needed in each one. And here's a little graph just to drive some of this thinking home. What I've got here is the number of parts in the assembly, and it's reducing from, in this case, 24 down to 2. And this is our assembly cost, and just on a scale of 0 to 1. Forget 1.2 for the moment. If we've got a large number of parts, then our manual assembly cost is quite high. Robotic, uh, robotic costs are in the middle, and 
and are motivated specifically designed for that purpose is quite low. But as we reduce the number of parts, see what happens. That the costs start to converge. I think as you would expect. But if this was to converge to just one part, we only needed one part in our assembly, then the cost would be the same between manual robotic and automatic. Yeah, it's one component to it, and nothing else is put into assembly. So that's the logical conclusion. So what this tells us is that as we try to reduce the number of parts in assembly to improve the efficiency, what we find happens is that these, the, 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 the difference between those techniques, they start to disappear. And the part becomes, or the issues become exactly the same, regardless of how we're going to do it. Reduce the number of parts, the efficiency increases across all the different ways of assembling it. That's the beauty of our system. Or that's the beauty of thinking about assembly in this way. That we can see that we've got a larger number of parts, and thinking about assembling it one way can reduce our costs. But as we refine it, the difference between the techniques starts to disappear. So if we can get a design with a fewer number of parts, gives us this thing that I pointed out earlier. It gives us flexibility to meet demand. Remember I said at the beginning that if we commit to a manual assembly and if we haven't designed the components correctly, it might be difficult to switch to a robotic assembly. What this tells us is that if we get a minimum number of parts, it makes that process easier. And so the clever companies who have a clever low number of parts in their design what they are buying is flexibility, so they can switch between methods of assembly much more easily than would otherwise be the case. So if you can minimise the number of parts, you're making life easier for your design in the future as demand changes. So remember that point. However, let's imagine we're going for robotic assembly. There are a number of things we've got to think about additionally. Obviously, we've got to think about the assembly task, but we've also got to think about the part design and its relation with the gripper design. How do these things interact? Here's an example of a, a simple assembly task. And all this is doing is picking up these components of a, a transfer line and putting them into a box. Simple, yeah? We could have humans doing that, couldn't we? doing this all day, picking up these parts. It's going to bore them to death, but they're going to get paid for it. We could do that. In this particular company, they've decided to use those two robotic arms to pick up these parts and put them into these components, into these uh, box to be transported. Now they can do this obviously much more quickly. They don't get tired. They don't decide to have to go to the toilet. Sometime I'll be back whenever. I need a coffee, I need food. As long as you've got these plugged into the main supply, they're going to work away all day. So you have to think about what's right for your product. Now, this product, this component has got grippers that are designed to grip this particular component in a certain way. Now, it might be that by gripping this part, something else, if it was human doing it, that the transfer of the grease from their hands onto the part might facilitate corrosion. Might be a problem. So you might want the operator to wear gloves. So what happens? They don't use rubber gloves. Their hands get start to sweat. It becomes even more difficult and unpleasant to do the job. But if we can design the gripper to pick up this part at exactly the right point every time and put it into the packaging in the right way quickly, then we're improving our design we're improving our assembly process dramatically. So this is one example of where we can get the robotic arm working to give us benefits. Now it brings us to the part design. Here we've got a component here, it's very simple. It's got a hole in the top and it's got a little hole in the side here. But we can tell that by for this product to be assembled, this hole has got to line up with something and this hole has to line up with something. Something has to go in there, otherwise there's no point in having it. Yeah? Now, 
it's easy for us to think that something, look at this and say, ah, oh, there's the hole. I have to put it in that way. Very difficult if you're on 40 cars. How does it know which way, on 360 degrees, where that hole is? Now you might say to me, oh, we could build in sensors. Um, and the sensor could scan that. That's the sensor scanning it. And it could find the hole. And then it could tell the robot in arm to move so many degrees that way and to pick it and to grip it. Now how long has it taken it to do that? The time it takes to sense it, the time it takes to move the robotic arm, and then to pick it up. A human being can do that instinctively, in fractions of a second. Easy. If we put just a little detail, like a flap, on the end of that component, then the robot can detect that very quickly. And it can be designed to just pick it up in that particular way. If that's in the right place relative to that hole, it will always assemble it in the right way. So by thinking about what the robot can and cannot do easily, we can change the component design to make it work better. Without changing the function, yeah, without changing the performance of the component, just by putting that feature on there makes life easier. And we can see examples of that happening again. <coughs> Here we've got components that can unfortunately lock together. If they've got the same diameter here as the diameter of that hole, or if that's slightly smaller than the diameter of that hole, they can potentially lock together in that way, which makes it difficult for us to take them apart. You can see in this one, what we've done is just make this part a little bit bigger than that hole, so they can never lock together. Now, to, to avoid that problem, We've had to think about it. Yeah, we've had to think, how might this part be assembled? How might it be delivered to the person who's having to do the assembly? And could this potential locking together actually happen? And how can I prevent it? And by making that change, you may have saved your company a lot of money, a lot of heartache, a lot of downtime. So, Getting those details right can save a lot of money in the long run, particularly if you're assembling these things in large quantities. Here's another one with a similar point. We've got a component here which has got a hole at the top which is different from the bottom. And again, it's easy for a human being to look at that and say, ah, the hole at the top is smaller than the one at the bottom. How does a robot detect that? How does it know at which end is a small hole, which end is a big hole? And so it can get it the right way around to assemble it. It's difficult. By adding an external feature like this, that's at the end for the large hole, the robot can detect that very quickly. The gripper can be designed just to grip it at that point. And so you immediately get the component in the right position, the right orientation in the assembly. And so your assembly time starts to reduce. <coughs> your efficiency increases. Again, you can put that feature on there without changing the function of the part. It's going to incur more cost to machine it. That's inevitable. You've got to decide whether that change is worth it. Whether the cost of the machining outweighs the benefit you get from improving your assembly process. So what I'm Pointing out here is that there's an intimate connection between the design of the component and how it's going to be assembled. And you have to think about that and make sure that you've got the design correct. Don't just design it and then say, well, it's up to the manufacturing people how it's going to be assembled. It isn't. It's up to you. Because only you know what the product's got to do in its entirety. I've seen examples on my uh, own career in industry where people on the shop floor of manufacturing made their own changes to a component because they thought, ah, this is difficult for us to, to put together. We'll make this little change and it'll help us to assemble it better. What happens? It goes into production. We sell it. goes out into the, the user and then it starts to fail. Something goes wrong. 
reason for that is that manufacturing, although they understand everything about the manufacturing and assembly process, they can't make the link with what the performance and function of the components got to be. Only you have that knowledge. So you have to make sure that you are the link and you fix these things. If manufacturing don't make these changes without consulting you, who is the person responsible for the overall product. Always remember that one. You can get caught out. I certainly was. Again, another example how we can change the detail to make sure that we get the part to fit correctly. So I'll just quickly go through a few of these. Here's one making the, the washer an integral part of the, the screw. Makes life a lot easier rather than having two separate parts. Having a recess for a bolt, rather than putting it on the end of the screw here, having a recess that holds the, the nut or you screw that in makes life a lot easier in terms of assembly, particularly if you're a robot. Different kinds of heads on the fasteners. This is a slotted screw one and this is a hexagonal one. The hexagonal head is much easier for a robot to deal with. You could, you could use a socket to pick up the part and to put it into position. Trying to hold it and then put a, a, a blade in there to screw that in is difficult enough when you're human, isn't it? Because the screw always falls out and you, you have to pick it up and hold it. It's difficult. So think about that. Even down to that level of detail can make a big difference. How do we make the heads of the fasteners easily accepted? This is quite tight. More space here allows us to get a socket in there <coughs> to insert or even remove the part. And I haven't talked about this assembly, but that's an important part of what you've got to achieve in your product, isn't it? We want to be able to disassemble it, recycle the materials. So we don't want to have a, a fastener that goes in here like this. And when we come to disassemble it, we can't get it, access it properly or quickly enough to make it financially viable. Think about that. Even thinking about the, if we've got a threaded rod, making sure that we've got a difference between one end and the other so that we don't assemble the part incorrectly. And this is one where we've added a little blip on the end here so we know that this is the end of the longer thread. Rather than having to have a sensor to try and detect that part. Very simple things make a big difference. Now this is an interesting one because a lot of you are thinking about using some kind of magazine to feed the powder, yeah, or feed the pellets into your accuhaler until they're broken into powder. Yeah? Some of you are thinking about that. So you've got to think about how these parts or these pellets that you're producing, how will they work relative to each other? Am I designed the pellet in such a way that they can't jam, they can't interlock, they can't stick together? Have I thought about that in my design? So you start to see here an interaction between the pellet you're going to use, the assembly and method of the whole product, and how you're going to reduce and present the part to the user to inhale. All of these things suddenly become interconnected. And you've got to see design in this way. That there's no longer a separation between manufacture, assembly, design, a stress analysis, the user using the product. All of these things are intimately connected. And you're the person who's uniquely placed to bring all these things together. And only you can get it right. And that's why you have such a big responsibility why you're in big demand in industry because not everybody can do that not everybody has the capacity to do that task you do make the most of it ok one or two others here, alignment fairly obvious so I'm just going to finish now and thinking about the gripper design just to drive this home let's imagine you had a component shaped like this maybe a cup, maybe a metal cone whatever circular in nature, and we want to assemble it, and we want it to assemble or snap fit into this recess. So this has got to go under here, and that's got to go under there. Fairly simple task. Yeah. Remember, this is circular in here, and this is circular in the bottom. So it's got to find its way into it. It's got to snap fit into it. 
How do we grip this? What kind of gripper would we use to make that happen? Okay. We know a number of things in this. We know that we need some kind of axial sending force. Something needs to force it into that recess, like any snap fit. Yeah? So we have to know what that assembly force is going to be. Now, if we calculate what that assembly force is, then we can design the gripper. We can design the compliance in the system. That is how much force and flexibility we need to put in. But if we don't know what that assembly force is, we can't design it. Now, what does a human being do? A human being feels. We push a little bit, a little bit more, and then it snaps into position. They could apply too much force and break it. Yeah? You might have the same operator who just puts it in position, hits it with a hammer, when they're not meant to. You do too much force, apply too quickly, and you damage the component. All of these things you need to tie together. So that's our starting point. And then we've got to think about the grip point. How do we actually hold this? And will gripping it there be sufficient? Or will it slip because of the friction or the lack of resistance to movement there? And will gripping it there damage it? Will we get a little dent because we applied too much gripping force? And will that not be obvious? we put it into the assembly and then we inspect it and say, oh, it's got a little dent in it. We have to take it apart. That costs us money. All these things you have to think about and design the component so we can deal with all these issues. So, we might think about putting a flap on the end of this component so we can grip directly onto it and minimise the slippage or the risk of slipping. Or, we might divide a suction gripper to hold it. Yeah? So you just create a vacuum in here, this is sucked up, held there, and we release it as you put it into the car. However we want to do it, we've got to think about what changes we make. And it might be if we get a suction on here, that we have to change the form of the top to make it easier. All of these things are connected. Alright, so let's summarise some of these rules. What we want to do generally, is to reduce the number of parts as far as possible. I know some of you are already instinctively thinking like that. Well, I suspect most of you are instinctively thinking about it like that because you want to have fewer parts to have to draw and model. <laughs> Correct? Fewer parts to have to analyse. That's what's driving your thinking at the moment. You're not thinking I'm producing fewer parts so it would be more efficient to assemble. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah? You're human, aren't you? We're all, we're all thinking the same way. You're trying to minimise the amount of work by minimising the parts. But is that going to give you the best design? I'm sorry, but you're going to have to think about that. Is it giving you the best design? And if it is, can you justify it? to include features to make components self-aligning so that they assemble easily. <coughs> Let's think about that. Particularly those of you who are using springs. Yeah, through the pelvis. Think about that. We might also want, uh, we know we're going to have some parts that are going to have some self-locating capability, whether it's a snap fit or some other mechanism. We have to make sure that design is correct. If you're going to have a, a snap fit, it's got to be designed because it proved to me it won't break during assembly. We have to think about that. And we need to think about if we're going to have grippers or robotic assembly that all the parts can be gripped by the robot gripper. And what kind of gripper would we use? So don't come along to your presentation and say, oh, this part is uh, going to be robotically assembled, uh, but I haven't actually designed or suggested what the gripper's going to be like. Until you've got the gripper, you don't know that that part will be able to be assembled. So you have to design the two things. So the people we took on the design for assembly are now realising, you maybe thought, mm, that's going to be the easiest thing. No. <laughs> okay. So 
some other things. We need to think about designing it so it can be assembled in a layered fashion directly from above. Think about that. How is it going to happen with your product? How do we actually put all the parts in place? If you look at the Acme Halo, it thinks about that very carefully. That's one of the good things about it. We've got to design the parts that are automatically fed without jamming. So think about the individual components. You know now that I'm going to look at your designs and say, are there any components in there that can jam together as they've been automatically fed? So watch out for that and get it right. And if the parts are presented in magazines, ensure that they're stable and that they will go through this process comfortably. And that applies to those of you who are delivering the medication in that way. It's the same problem. It requires the same level of attention. Okay, we can conclude with the alarm problem this enough. Seeing that we a selection of appropriate assembly methods is not a simple task, we have to think about it carefully. It requires uh, consideration of investment, it requires consideration of your strategy, your production quantity, and the speed that we need to do this. And the final point, the effectiveness of that assembly method is dependent to a large extent on the design of the components that are being assembled, and you are designing these components. Please get that absolutely correct. That black screen means that's the end. Any questions? I'll give you something to think about. Yeah? Maybe something you hadn't considered before. Well, if nothing else, 